What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Three and Out YouTube page. I'm John Middlecoff, and we are talking football all day, every day. Make sure you subscribe, like the video, share it with your friends. Let's roll, baby. Okay, let's do a little Middlecoff mailbag. At John Middlecoff Instagram, DMs wide open. Fire in them. Get your question answered here. A little thing called the podcast from Derek. I'm a diehard Ducks fan, which is translated into me being a Chargers fan once they picked Herbert. Let's take a look at the coaches Herbert has had since his freshman year at Oregon. 16, Helfrich. 17, Willie Taggart. 18 and 19, Cristobal. 21 through 23, Brandon Staley. 20, Anthony, I skipped Anthony Lynn. You could make an argument that Helfrich is the best coach on this list. Has there ever been a quarterback to have this much success despite having awful coaches every single year in his career? That's pretty wild. I mean, that is a terrible list. Think about this. Mario... Great recruiter, averages the day as long as a coach. I mean, Taggart's a disaster. Brandon Staley, pretty well documented. If Brandon Staley is your head coach, I mean, that's not great. Listen, the defense of Justin Herbert, and a lot of people push back, overrated, he's not that good. We're about to find out. Because I'll promise you this, in a couple years, you ain't going to be saying that. You put him with Jim Harbaugh, Maybe all those guys had to happen so he could link up with Jim Harbaugh. Because think about the best coach or quarterbacks in the league. Mahomes, Andy Reid, Hall of Famer. Lamar Jackson, John Harbaugh, Hall of Famer. Josh Allen. People like Sean, I don't know if Sean McDermott wins 11, 12 games every single year. I'd say Sean McDermott's pretty good. I mean, I, I think he's pretty good. I wouldn't put him on John Harbaugh Randy's level, but he's clearly a high-end coach in the NFL. Matt Stafford, now Sean McVay, kicking ass, taking names. So, like, who your coach is, it's hard to overcome. Look at Matt Stafford all those years with the Lions. It, it, a lot of losing, man. You, you, this is not basketball, where it's like, yeah, I got I got LeBron, I, I got Steph in his prime, I got whoever, I'm going to be competitive. If your head coach is not good in the sport of football, in, in Power 5 or the NFL, good luck. It's probably not going to go well. Wish I got this in there for the mailbag, but you touched on it in there, so I wanted to ask anyhow. You mentioned a little bit about working for Howie. Mentioned you had worked a sort of personal assistant for him. It was a lot of work. Could you do some time on what those front office jobs entail? What was that personal assistant job? Were you writing up spreadsheets for Howie? Film? Research? For example, you joked about how you're not sitting around now waiting for the summer and camp to start. Well, what are they doing right now? What's the type of content context that's not out there I know me and my buddies will love? Well, during this period of time, during OTAs, uh, you're kind of just learning the job, right? They're teaching you what to look for. You're kind of learning the league. You're watching some film, but you're also like you cut guys during OTAs. So it's usually your job to go grab them. Uh, you know, you you bring in a lot of guys for workouts, undrafted free agents. So who picks them up in a van? Me. During training camp and during the season, one thing, and I, I would imagine this doesn't happen now with technology and artificial intelligence and just everything. We had to manually input injuries. So I would go on Roto World during training camp in the season and in a guy's basically in a profile for a player. So let's just pick a guy. Uh, C.D. Lamb. Let's say C.D. Lamb hurts his hamstring in training camp and he's out for two weeks. You would manually write hamstring injury. It, it sounds archaic now, but that's that's something... There was a various, a very serious part of the job, inputting injuries. And then when guys were cut, 
or whatever during the year and during training camp, you would have that the draft room with every team and their roster on magnets. It would be your job to take the magnet on, take the magnet off. When a guy got on injured reserve, you would put him on injured reserve, and whoever they signed or elevated from the practice squad, you would add that. So a lot of magnets, a lot of injury inputting, a lot of picking guys up from the airport. When you'd sign a player, take him to the doctor, take him around all the people he had to see with the team. Uh, you would you would have jobs to watch film as well, and you would just try to figure that out throughout the time. You would help with advance reports. So during the season, when Lewis Riddick or the pro scouts were doing the advance report, you would do tasks for them, whether it was drawing stuff, um, you know, all sorts of random shit. You would help coaches out whatever they needed. Any little project might get thrown on your desk. I'm trying to think. It's been a long time. Uh, a lot of airport runs. Y you make, on a given week, you could do several airport runs. And, and obviously during training camp, your job was to get the guys for cutting them, which sucked. But you, you, you had to do it, right? And at the time, playbook, information, coach wants to see you. <laughs> I mean, that's, it, it's, it's a shitty job. And then obviously during the off season, it changes. They, send, they start sending you out to some pro days. Uh, you just, you're all constantly holding lists uh, and just doing whatever they need. So I'm trying to think of some other tasks. I help the special teams coach a lot, identify guys. It's a lot of pretty low level tasks, but you better not fuck up. Cause if you do, you're going to get yelled at <laughs> by a lot of different people. So one thing I, I used to do is, and this, so 2010, I, everyone has a phone now with the weather. You'd print out the weather all week long, Monday through Friday, and drop it off on the coach's desk. So if you're playing at Chicago or Green Bay or, you know, we're at Tampa, like how hot's it going to be? How cold's it going to be? Is it going to rain? So I, I would do that every week. The, the the daily wire, when guys are cut, when guys, you know, whatever, it's kind of your job to make sure that's distributed. Um, you watch a lot of practice squad guys. So you're constantly writing reports on that. They give you a couple teams. So you might get two or three teams during the year. And you basically have to write up every guy on that team. And then you're also focused on free agents, on restricted free agents, having updated reports. You help the college scouts out sometimes, do random stuff. Um, you, you just, any anything that needs to get done. You know, go pick up food. You know, like we're working on Saturday, go pick up a bunch of sandwiches. So it's, it's a lot of tasks that most people do when they're the lowest guy on the totem pole. We are this close to crowning an NBA champ. And with action heating up on the court, it's even hotter at DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NBA. There are only so many games left, and DraftKings Sportsbook has you covered with same game parlays, live betting, odds boost, and so much more. Don't miss out or you'll have to wait until the next NBA season to place your bets. It's super easy for first-timers to get started. Try betting on something simple, like picking a team to win. Go to DraftKings Sportsbook app, select your squad, and place your first bet. It's that simple. New to DraftKings? Listen up. New customers can get a no-sweat bet up to 1500 bucks. Just deposit at least 5 bucks, and you'll get a bonus bet back equal to your first bet if it doesn't hit. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now and use the code JOHN. That's code J-O-H-N for new customers to get a no-sweat bet up to $1,500 if your first bet doesn't hit. Only on DraftKings. The crown is yours. Question for the pod. Which five teams do you think that are set up for the most sustainable success for the next five to ten years? Well, I, I think you just look at coaching quarterback. So you go... Andy Reid, 66. He's got five more years left in him. Patrick Mahomes is 27, 28. They got to be the number one draft pick. Um, Jim Harbaugh, Justin Herbert. I think you're betting on that. D'Amico Ryan, CJ Stroud. I, I think you're betting on that. To me, it's just combination coach quarterback. 
you know, Purdy, can he be a superstar? If he becomes like the next version of Drew Brees, like the Niners ain't going away. The Rams are a good example. Like coach quarterback, awesome right now, but Stafford's 35 with a lot of wear and tear on his tires. You know, so he's got to go around the league, coach quarterback. If you got the coach, you got the quarterback. I, I, I really think it's that simple. It's really what the league boils down to. It's like, who's good in the NBA? Well, do you have a top five, six player? Because if you do, you got a chance. In football, it's like, would you have a top quarterback and a top coach? Then you got a shot. Because the the contracts and stuff, things change so fast, guys get injured. It's hard to look at the totality of a roster. But I would say the things that have sustained, like a lot of turnover in Buffalo. Betting on Josh Allen being good. Lamar Jackson, like he's kind of been good now for five plus years. John Harbaugh has been pretty consistent for a while. Like I would imagine the Ravens ain't going away. Long-time listener, first-time direct messenger. Love the pot. I'm a displaced Western PA Steelers fan that now lives in Philly. You've alluded to the transition from Kevin Colbert and Khan a few times. Khan brings his salary cap expertise to the GM role. Mike Tomlin is definitely a head coach with input to the ingredients that he cooks with. Also, on the management team, Andy Wilde, I don't think your paths crossed in Philly. They did not. What are your thoughts on the influence of Weidel and his team-building approach with his ties to the Eagles? I think sometimes these cap guys and these number guys like to have like a scout scout as their right-hand guy. And I, I can't tell you like Andy Weidel's write-ups, but longtime right-hand man to Joe Douglas – he works for the Ravens for a long time. He's a football guy. Like, he likes to scout. The dude in Minnesota, Quessy, who's his right-hand man? Grigson, a scout. So, you know, how much they lean on those guys with the draft, it, it probably changes from place to place. But I think it's pretty consistent when you get, you know, Chris Ballard at his core is a, is a scout, Right. Some of these guys, Les Snead is a scout. So they are more dependent on the money analytic guys, right? So you get these analytical guys or the contract guys, they need someone with a large scouting background. They can help them run the department. They can run the pro side, the college side. They kind of oversee everything. Because really, when you're the GM, you're not just watching tape all day. <clears throat> I would imagine that's kind of a small part of the job. On a given day, you might not even be able to watch that much. I mean, you're dealing with everything from cafeteria to the training room to the equipment staff, dealing with your coach, dealing with the owner, dealing with agent that your players issues through agents, right? You're not just sitting there like ranking players 24-7, 365. I would imagine most general managers would say it's a, it's a small percentage of my job. Now that in the off season during the draft, you have to, but... During the year, probably less and less than ever before. So I, I don't know. I've met Wild uh, Andy Weidel one time, but I, I can't pretend to have a good feel for him as a scout or anything. I know it didn't end up great in Philly. Grew up in Scottsdale my whole life. Glad to hear you are enjoying it. I'm a graduate from LSU. And as a reward, I'm going to LSU versus USC opener in Vegas. Use the game time code John. I like this guy already. I was never a big college football fan before LSU. But this place makes you a fan. When you, Colin Klatt, talk about the explosion of college football, the only pushback I give is in an area like Arizona, where even with a decent team here and there, it's no SEC fandom. Do you think the conference realignment can grow the game in places like Arizona and Cali? Or are those markets always going to be more pro-focused? Yeah, I, Cali, like when USC is good, they're a really big deal in Southern California. Stanford was a top five program and they got 10,000 people showing up. So the Bay Area is just going to be overrun by the 49ers. But Southern California, USC can make a dent. UCLA, probably not as much, but USC can. Living in Scottsdale now for years, I, I would say Arizona State might as well just play like Fresno State and Boise State. 
it's never going to be a big football program ever. No matter how cool this place is to live, no matter how many babes there are, in theory, it should be a great place to recruit. It just never will. It's, it's a, it's a bottom tier athletic program. It's a baseball and golf school. So I, I think Arizona State has zero opportunity to ever be a big deal here. None. I, I don't believe it's possible. And I believe they'll go to the Big 12 and get worked. And listen, I, I think Arizona State should basically be San Diego State. Same level. You know, try to win eight, nine games and play those type of opponents. I don't believe they should be playing Kansas State and Oklahoma State. Like, it's just not going to work. Maybe once upon a time it could have, but in present day setup, like I don't believe they have any chance. Arizona, like Tucson, two hours away, much smaller city. They take basketball there very, very seriously. You are what you take seriously. At Arizona State, they take men's golf seriously. They get pros every year. They take baseball really seriously. They get a bunch of high-end guys. Maybe the program's dipped a little lately, but... Like the, their emphasis is not in basketball or, or football. We're at USC that they, they pump a lot of money into football, right? At Oregon, they, they take sports and football very, very seriously. I, I just don't see it ever being possible. I, I actually think it's kind of a bad, it's just not a great sports town. I, I just don't think that many people care. I think people like sports, but they're just. Does anyone care about the Diamondbacks? I mean, the Cardinals, you see a lot of like flags, and but it's like, this is a Niner home game once a year. <laughs> so I I don't know. I, I just don't think it's a great sports area. Not great history, probably. I mean, there are a lot of factors. A lot of, a lot of uh, <clears throat> you know, people from out of town. It's kind of a, uh, a lot of older people that retire here from colder states. I can't tell you every time I play golf, it's like, oh, yeah, I'm a big Minnesota Viking fan. Diehard Chicago Bears guy. Moved here to get out of the cold. I love my Packers. Football's huge. I never meet anyone in Arizona that or play golf with anyone that's not a big football fan. But they usually like teams from other places. I go once a year to watch the Wisconsin Badgers. Meet a lot of people in from the Midwest. What was with all the dudes at the draft wearing sunglasses inside at night? Is there something to that? I've never understood sunglasses at night, ever. Now, granted, I, I need to go to the optometrist. I think my eyes are slipping. Um, my dad wore glasses. I've always thought I had pretty good eyesight until I got my driver's license last year, that my Arizona license, and they made you take the eye test, and I, I, I couldn't see. And I was like reading off the letters and she's like, oh, different letter. She kind of helped me cheat. They, they don't care here much. I was like, God, my eyes. But if you wear dark glasses at night, like how do you see anything? I understand. Like, listen, I'm not a fashionista here, but maybe you think it looks good. I, I just don't know how functionally you see anything, but people trying to be cool. <laughs> I, mean, I, I really think it's that simple. Like just trying to be cool. But can you see? Like part of wearing sunglasses, you know, I just was on a five hour or not five hours, three hour drive yesterday in the afternoon, sun bearing down at you without the sunglasses, you just wouldn't be able to see the road. But at night in the dark, I don't know. Don't get it. Question comment for the pod. Have you seen Debo's latest Twitter back and forth with boxer Devin Haney? Can't help but laugh at the irony of Debo trying to make fun of a multiple-time world champion for losing a championship bout, especially coming from someone who is very outspoken about fans withholding criticism and just being fans. That aside, if given an ultimatum of Debo versus Ayuk, do the Niners care about these off-field antics, or is it minor comparison to the factors of on-field impact and age? I got news for you. Nobody with any common sense, gives a flying fuck about any Twitter interaction. Like, th there can't be a place 
that is honestly or should be even more irrelevant to society than it is. The reason it gets talked about so much like on television stuff, because the media lives on it. They're on it 24-7, 365. It's like their happy place. Even though they like, I'm leaving when Elon bought it. Like you did not only leave, you guys have doubled down. Like I'm going to threads. No, you're not. You tweet more now than ever. But interactions, I, I don't think, they probably don't even know what happened. It does not matter. It could not matter any less. Yeah, Debo, like, talking shit about the... I always hate when players talk bad about the fans. You guys do know where the money comes from? From those guys. Now, obviously, there's a line you can't cross, but, like, if it's booing or something, like, I can't believe these guys, the stuff they said to me in my mentions. Don't check them. I mean, you don't have to sign on. And you can't take the good with the bad. Like, you love it when you dominate and everyone's blowing you on there. It's like, woohoo! And then you have a bad game and everyone's shitting on you. It's like, these fans are such assholes. They only care about me when I'm a fantasy team. Well, you, you love the last two weeks when you had three touchdowns and you're retweeting and liking. It's the problem with social media. It's like, everyone loves the good, but they hate the bad. I didn't see it. And yeah, I, I don't, I'd be I'm not Chris Mannix here to, uh, I know nothing about Haney. Well, I don't even know why Debo would. Does he not like the? Was he rooting for the other fighter? I don't. I don't get it. But I just think they want Debo to be in shape and get open on down the field routes. I mean, he could not get open in the Super Bowl. The Chiefs clamped him down like it was me. It was honestly an enlightening experience. I think for Kyle, that's why they drafted a wide receiver in the first round. And Debo is. Uh, is kind of a one of one, right? Like he's a dominant player behind the line of scrimmage, but he is a wide receiver. So it's like, can you run some routes? And sometimes he can, like he can go over the middle, but he doesn't stretch the field, doesn't make any plays down the field in terms of, it's just not really his game. So they're also, they've already paid him. Like he's on the team because of his contract. If he, if like all things were equal and they could have gotten rid of one, they would have gotten rid of Debo Samuel and just signed Brandon Ayuk. But the problem is Debo makes 20, Brandon Ayuk wants 30. It just gets very expensive for a team that doesn't even pass that often. Like they're, they're never going to have a hundred catch wide receiver. So first thing, they do not care at all about anything back and forth on Twitter or Instagram. Obviously there's a line like, Certain things you can't do or say, but just like talking shit to someone else, nobody cares. Okay, last one. With all the contract talks recently regarding wide receivers, I'd love to know your thoughts on AJ Brown's three year, $96 million extension and Devontae's three year, $75 million extension. Did Howie smartly jump the market and overpay? Well, it's, A.J. Brown's a lot like Dak, right? The Eagles initially gave him a large extension. And then he balled. So he's due for a big raise, right? So it's he's an expensive player. He was an expensive player the last couple of years. So if you're going to give him an extension, you're going to have to come up. I don't have the numbers in front of me, but you start talking $30 million a year range. He was just making, what was he making, Twenty two. So when you factor in multiple years, the inflation of the of the position, kind of the cost of doing business. Like if A.J. Brown was it hit the free agent market, someone would have given him a four-year contract for what? $135 million? You know, Devontae, this is the thing. Like they're going to be a passing team. I know they're going to want to run the ball again. In theory, they will because they have Saquon now. But the Eagles like passing it. They always have and always will. Because that's what the owner likes doing. So you have one of the better number two wide receivers in the NFL. And same type thing. Like, ideally, do you want to be paying two wide receivers $175 million of combined contracts? I mean, it's it's a lot allocated to two guys. But if you pass it all the time and they're both worth it, yeah. What are you going to do? Let Devontae walk? You drafted them. You love them. Just, I just think it's the cost. I Yeah, good contracts. I don't, I never have a problem with paying a guy a lot of money. He's a good player. 
especially when he's your own guy and you can win with him. Uh, it's just expensive. And now they are, they, they're spending a lot of money on the offense. That's why there's going to be a lot of pressure on Kellen Moore. Quarterback makes a ton. Line, left tackles paid. The right tackles paid. Guards paid. Running backs paid. Tight ends paid. Wide receivers are paid. I would say anything but like a top five offense next year is going to be viewed as a disappointment with Eagles. I think there's a ton of pressure on the productivity to a lot of the players. And same thing with defense. Jordan Davis and Jalen Carter. Like there, there's going to be tangible pressure on those two guys to ball. Especially Jalen Carter. Top 10 pick. You have all the talent in the world. Vic Fangio, what he's done with defensive linemen, turned them into stars and had Pro Bowl impact guys. You've invested a lot of capital in all these players, paying them a lot of money. I think the Eagles, I, everyone, and probably including myself, are going to pick them to win the division, but I don't know, man. We'll see. Because you start paying a lot of money, the expectations go even higher. And coming off a down year, I, I can't I, – A.J. Brown's really good. Devontae Smith's really good. It's kind of the cost of doing business. Right. I, the, the hard part is, you know, when you have a number two wide receiver and you have a clear one, like AJ Brown, clear one, Jamar Chase, clear one. How much is your number two, like the Bengals? Do you want to give T. Higgins that type deal? Clearly, they're hesitant to do it. Now, I would say Devontae is a better player than T. Higgins, but that's the, that's the Niners problem. It's like Debo's not even a number one. Ayuk is probably not a number one, but he's like Devonte. He's not. He's better than a two, but he'll never be like a top five or six guy in the league. It's just conundrum. And then how do we play? Eagles, we want to pass. We want to pass a lot. It drives people nuts sometimes, but they do. It's who they are. I don't think it's going to change much. Saquon's going to touch the ball a lot, but I bet they throw him the ball a lot. A lot of wheel routes, a lot of screens. They get the ball to him. Don't expect him to have twenty carries a game. That is not the way the Eagles play. They get their dynamic running backs the ball. They get them their touches, but they do it in the passing game. So I think the Eagles are one of the more fascinating teams in the league because of their talent, because of the new coaching staff, or new coordinators, same head coach. And uh, I, I think the division, you know, Cowboys have won the division two of the last three years. I don't think there are many people, including in Dallas, that feel that good about that squad. 